I'm very privileged and honored to be able to introduce Dr. Sheldrake to you. Well, thank you, Hardo, and thank you for this opportunity to speak uh, online. This is the first time I've done this. Well, today you asked me to speak about the theme of the rebirth of nature, um, you know, the recovery of nature, the, the coming to life of nature again, life you know, coming back where there was death. And in a sense, that's the story I'm going to tell today. Um, we have a scientific worldview at present, which says that nature is inanimate, machine-like, um, unconscious or non-conscious, um, that we live in a world where everything is just based on uh, the action of blind physical forces, random chance, um, mechanical events. Um, the whole of nature is non-conscious, the entire universe, the stars, the galaxies, everything we look at is non-conscious. Animals and plants are nothing but machines. And we're nothing but a machine either, a lumbering robot, to use Richard Dawkins' uh, vivid phrase. Um, our minds are computers. Uh, our consciousness doesn't actually do anything. It's a kind of illusion. Um, everything would go on just as well with the computational machinery of our brains. Uh, even if we weren't con conscious, if we were zombies. Uh, there's no purpose in nature. This is the worldview that we've all been brought up with. It's the official worldview. Its, its name, uh, philosophical name, is mechanistic materialism. Materialism is the doctrine that matter is the only reality. Um, mechanistic uh, means that it's uh, machine-like um, in its nature. Now, What's happening today and what's so exciting, I think, at the moment is that science itself is breaking out of this worldview, which it's actually uh, held to in, in its mechanistic form for 400 years. I'm going to start with a historical overview because it makes it easier to understand where we are now uh, when we look at how we've got here. And then I'm going to show how changes in science over the last century or so have been uh, gradually loosening the grip of this mechanistic worldview until we're finally almost breaking out of it and uh, coming to a whole new phase of science. And because science has so much influence on our intellectual life, a new phase of society and our culture. Now, the view of nature as inanimate and machine-like is extraordinarily unusual in the history of humanity. Virtually all cultures, all societies have taken it for granted that nature is alive, that we live in a living world. Um, and they've just assumed that plants are really alive, animals are really alive, the earth, mother earth is alive, the stars and the planets are alive, living beings. I mean, we still call the planets by the names of the old gods and goddesses, Mars, Mercury, Venus, and so on. Um, everyone assumed that. Um, <clears throat> in shamanic societies, for example, this is still taken for granted. Um, our ancestors took it for granted too. Um, and I, even our intellectual ancestors in ancient Greece, uh, the view that nature was alive was the common, normal view. And the great philosopher Aristotle um, put this into philosophical language um, and probably uh, made the clearest statement of, of this animistic or worldview. Aristotle said that um, everything in nature that's alive as a soul, or rather is within a soul. For Aristotle, the body's within the soul, not the soul within the body. Every plant has a soul. Every animal has a soul. Um, we have souls. The earth has a soul. The stars and planets have souls. They're alive. And Aristotle then went on to say more than just that. He said, what does the soul actually do? Well, the role of the soul is to give form to the body. So the the soul of an oak tree, for example, shapes the growing seedling, oak seedling, um, and turns it into an oak tree, gives it the form or pattern or shape of the oak tree. And it works by attraction. It attracts the oak tree as it grows towards its mature form. Um, souls work through attraction. And they give what Aristotle called final causes, they, as well as formal causes. 
um, I don't want to get too deeply into ancient philosophy, but this is an important part of our understanding of what's happening today. Aristotle pointed out to explain anything, you need four causes. The material cause, the thing of which it's made, and the example he gave was a sculptor making a sculpture. Uh, you need a block of marble to make the sculpture. Without the material, nothing will happen. You need an energetic cause, a moving cause, and that's the chisel hitting the, the stone. That's what makes the, the sculpture possible. But if you just had those two, you just have a chipping, uh, and you'd end up with a pile of marble chippings. Um, you also have to have a form, and that's the uh, form in the mind of the sculptor. Say it's a statue of an eminent citizen who's recently died and who's being put up in the marketplace. That's the formal cause, the, the form, the shape in the mind of the sculptor. And then there's the final cause, which is the purpose. Why is he making the sculpture? Well, he's making it because he's been paid to do so. He's had a commission to do so uh, because uh, they want to honor this person and put his statue up in the marketplace. None of, none of this would happen without all four causes. And Aristotle pointed out that in the realm of life, the soul, the soul of a plant, as it shapes the plant, gives it its form, like the form of the oak tree, as I mentioned. It also attracts it towards its end or goal, which is its mature form setting seed and reproducing. So in animals and plants and in us, the soul gives the, the shape, the form, and the purpose. So anyway, this is the kind of philosophy of nature which was taken up in the Middle Ages in Europe, particularly by St. Thomas Aquinas, the 13th century theologian and philosopher, who did much to shape the orthodoxy of medieval thought. He formed a kind of Christian animism. Uh, he took over Aristotle's idea, nature's alive, uh, every, all animals and plants are truly alive, the earth's alive, the stars, the planets are alive. They all have souls. Uh, the soul shapes the bodies of all these things. And the ultimate source of all these souls and nature is God. So there's a living God who works in and through nature, a living nature, uh, with souls uh, which give everything their life. Um, humans uh, share with plants a vegetative soul that shapes their body with animals, an animal soul that gives them their instincts. And of course, the Latin word animal comes from the uh, the Latin, uh, our English word animal comes from the Latin word animalium, uh, and, and the, uh, that comes from anima, the, the soul. So uh, the idea is that we also are part of nature. Our souls connect us with plants and animals, but in addition we have a rational mind, a soul that's concerned with reason, thought, language, and so on. Uh, but that's embedded within a much larger psychic system. Well, this was the worldview in the Middle Ages, and it's the worldview out of which the great Gothic cathedrals uh, emerged. It was a very sophisticated view that brought together science, theology, philosophy, and an understanding of living nature, and a sense of participation in it. Now, it's precisely this worldview that was rejected with the foundation of modern science in the 17th century. The mechanistic revolution was a revolution precisely because it overthrew that ancient worldview. And what it replaced it with was the vision of nature as a machine. The universe was like a machine. Uh, an obvious example that gave, enabled people to think like this were the clockwork models of the universe in those great clocks that uh, still exist in some cathedrals, medieval clocks, like in Wells Cathedral in England, uh, which modeled the universe, or modeled the movements of the, the, um, the moon and the sun um, in clockwork. So the, the universe was a machine, animals were machines, plants were machines. This vision, which came to the young French philosopher René Descartes, in 1619, so it's just over 400 years ago that this happened, um, uh, was for him a liberating vision because it showed that everything in nature could be treated as a machine. Mathematically, uh, it could be treated in terms of mathematical, physical laws, and it opened up the possibility of a new kind of science, um, mechanistic science. And this was, of course, immensely successful. And um, it enabled um, 
Newton to come up with his laws of gravitation to enable uh, movements of planetary motion to be understood uh, in a new way. It enabled uh, all sorts of uh, machinery to be built. Um, by the end of the 18th century, this mechanistic view of nature was enormously prestigious. Um, and uh, it was the basis of enlightenment rationalism, you know, that humans have now found out the secrets of nature can conquer nature through their minds and through science and technology and through economic development and social progress. A whole new future opens for humanity. This was the Enlightenment vision uh, based on mechanistic science. Now, in the 17th century, Descartes' vision uh, was basically dualistic. It had a mechanical, inanimate, machine-like nature, but it didn't get rid of God or angels or the religious realm. It simply put them in a completely separate compartment, outside space and time, outside nature, in a realm of supernatural being, um, outside nature. Nature was autonomous, went on mechanically, but there were God, angels, and human reason, human minds, existed outside time and space, outside the material universe. They were separate. And this created a separate realm of science, which got the whole universe, and religion, which got God, angels, and human morality, um, still could carry on, but in kind of parallel, separate track. Uh, it also created a separation between humans and the rest of nature. We had rational minds and were part of, uh, in, in, linked to the spiritual realm, but animals, plants, and the rest of nature were inanimate machines and therefore inferior to us to be exploited at will. Um, and it led, of course, to the separation between body and mind, the matter and spirit. Uh, this is called Cartesian dualism after Descartes. His name was Cart, Cartesian. Um, so this is what prevailed really in science in, in, until the uh, 18th century. Um, then there were two movements which shaped the modern world and which I think we need to again focus on a little bit. Um, the first was that this mechanistic view of nature as inanimate machinery was obviously um, at variance with our own direct experience. And in the late 18th century, the Romantic movement was a kind of rebellion against that. It said, no, we're not just calculating machines. We're not just rational minds. We have emotions, we have passions, we have enthusiasms. And nature is not just dead, it's full of life. And the Romantic poets like Wordsworth in England uh, gave a new vision of living nature. Um, under the Romantic movement. And what actually happened as a result of that was a kind of split in European civilization. Um, most people were influenced by Romantic visions of nature. It became a major feature in landscape gardening. It became a major part of our culture. Um, but it became part of our private world, the Romantic uh, vision. And what we've ended up with is a split culture where in our private lives, in the evenings and weekends, on holidays, uh, we want to get back to nature. Uh, people get rich so they can buy a place in the country and get back to nature, away from it all. But Mondays to Fridays, nine to five, the official worldview is mechanistic materialism. Nature is a collection of raw materials to exploit. Um, the uh, world is just a machine understood scientifically and mathematically and mechanically. Um, and so we've ended up with a split culture, and we've exported that to the rest of the world, to Indians, Chinese, the South Americans, Africans. Uh, they all go along with this mechanistic materialist worldview during working hours, but then they revert to their more traditional cultural views uh, at weekends and in the evenings and on holiday. Um, so not a very satisfactory state of affairs. Um, so that was one... Uh, change uh, that occurred. The other change in the 19th century was that more and more people grew tired of this split, uh, the, the dualistic split of Cartesian dualism, and wanted to go beyond it. And most of them wanted to have just one thing, not two things. One school of thought was called the idealists. and uh, They said everything is consciousness, matters sort of done, done mind. Um, and that was very influential in 19th century philosophy. In Germany, for example, Hegel was an idealist philosopher. Um, 
but the school that predominated really within science was materialism. This took the Cartesian split of matter and spirit and said, there's no such thing as spirit, there's only matter. Um, there's just one thing, not two things. And therefore, at one stroke, this inanimate matter became the only reality. God and angels simply vanished. They were like a puff uh, of smoke. A puff, they've gone. Because um, if you say there's no such thing as the realm of spirit, there's only matter, then the supernatural realm of God and spirits and angels is no, just simply doesn't exist. Um, and all that's left is human minds, and they're now just nothing but the activity of human brains. They're inside heads. And if people want to go on believing in God or angels or spirits or anything like that, then these are just ideas in human minds and therefore inside human brains. They're not really out there. They're just human fantasies or delusions. So we get to the standard materialist, mechanistic, atheistic worldview, which is the predominant default setting of most university graduates today. It's what's taught in universities, maintained through the serious media, um, and is the standard worldview. Well, um, all that uh, reached its peak, really, in the 19th century, when people imagined that soon science would be able to explain everything. At the beginning of the 19th century, the famous French physicist, Pierre Laplace, famously said that an, in a disembodied intelligence that was told the position of every particle in the universe um, and the, knew all the laws of motion could work out absolutely everything that was going to happen because there was no freedom. Everything was determined and fixed by the laws of nature. And in the 1860s, Thomas Henry Huxley, the main defender of Darwin's theory of evolution, said that uh, such an intelligence, if given enough information about the original state of particles and the laws of nature, could predict in every detail the fauna of Great Britain in uh, 1869. The whole of evolution would be totally predicted and predictable and foreseeable. Everything was determined, rigidly determined, no free will. And that was the worldview of 19th century materialism. But that worldview, which is still the worldview, which is, is the kind of standard background of modern atheism and, a, and materialistic atheism, has been coming unraveled gradually at first and then more rapidly. And that's the story I now want to tell, how we're going beyond it. One of the first unravelings was through quantum theory in the 1920s, with the realization that processes at the quantum level are indeterminate, unpredictable in principle, only predictable in terms of probabilities. The so-called uncertainty principle of Heisenberg um, means that the, uh, uh, there's no longer this rigid determinism, at least at the quantum level. Um, because genetic mutations are quantum events, this meant that um, in the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution, there was true randomness in mutation. There was a freedom of spontaneity that hadn't been there before, in, like in T.H. Huxley's vision. Um, there was a, 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 a kind of emerging freedom and openness in the whole evolutionary process. And then with chaos and complexity theories, there was a realization that actually most of nature has never been predictable the breaking of a wave, the behavior of the weather, um, all sorts of perfectly normal natural phenomena are not predictable in detail. There's a kind of openness, spontaneity, and freedom uh, in the whole of nature that in the 19th century, no one could imagine. Um, so that's one change that's occurred. <clears throat> Another change uh, came about really in the 1920s, um, partly because of quantum theory. The, great philosopher Alfred North Whitehead uh, realized that modern science was pointing us towards a vision not of nature being reducible just to one level, atoms, um, as in reductive atomism, but as a series of organisms. And this was the beginning of a holistic or organismic view of nature. Um, Whitehead had the idea that, um, that an atom is a kind of organism. Um, a molecule is a kind of organism with parts interacting together. It's not a machine. These are interacting parts. They're parts of a process. 
Because as Whitehead realized, what quantum theory is telling us is that nature is made up of processes. Before that, people thought that nature was made up of stuff, little bits of stuff like little billiard balls, like atoms that were just hard and impenetrable and just remained the same forever. But quantum theory shows that there's no such thing as inanimate stuff. There's processes, an electron is a vibratory process, an atom is a vibratory process. It's a structure of vibrations, a crystal is a structure of vibrations. So what Whitehead showed was that physics is talking about small organisms, atoms and molecules. Biology is talking about larger organisms, animals and plants and microbes and fungi. Um, but then when we look at the cosmos, there are even bigger organisms. There's the sun, there's the solar system, there's the galaxy. Um, in the 20th century, this holistic view of nature has come to a recognition that nature is made up of many levels of organization. At each level, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. I have a diagram here that illustrates this. Um, um, and in this diagram, we can see a series of levels. Let, let us show that diagram now. Um, there's a series of levels um, and th at each level, the whole is like a larger circle containing parts, which are parts within it. And the, those parts could be subatomic particles, they could be um, within atoms, uh, those could be atoms within molecules, molecules within crystals, all those smaller, smaller circles could be organelles in cells, in tissues, in organs, in organisms, in societies of organisms, in ecosystems, or they could be uh, planets inside solar systems, inside galaxies, inside galactic clusters. Um, we see this pattern of nested hierarchy or holarchy um, all through nature at every level, and indeed our own language models this, the, uh, mirrors this. It's one reason language can enable us to understand nature, uh, because it has a similar kind of structure itself. The smallest circles could be phonemes inside words, inside sentences, uh, inside um, paragraphs. Uh, so we have a, a series of hierarchical levels of organization in nature. Um, we can call it a nested hierarchy, but if you don't like the word hierarchy, a better word is holarchy which the philosopher and writer Arthur Kerstler suggested. And he suggested that each level, the wholeness that's more than the sum of the parts, is a holon, H-O-L-O-N, a holon. Um, and holons contain parts, which are themselves holons at a lower level, and they themselves can be parts of a larger uh, level of organization. So this gives us a view of nature as made up of nested hierarchies, and instead of trying to reduce everything to atoms or subatomic particles and explain everything in terms of quarks or, um, or some other subatomic particle, uh, we have to understand that nature is always nested at all these different levels. And in practice, what the sciences do is st study different levels. Physiology studies the functioning and interrelation of organs within the bodies. It doesn't try and reduce them to quarks. Uh, sociology looks at the movement, the uh, social groups and their patterns and individuals within them and how social groups interact, what kind of functions and structures they have. Um, uh, you know, crystallography looks at the molecules within crystals and the way they're organized within crystals. Cosmology looks at galaxies and the way that stars are organized within them. Astronomy looks at the patterns within solar systems. We have all these different levels and all these different sciences that look at different levels. There's no one level that's supreme uh, above all the others to which everything can be reduced. That, so that's one, uh, another aspect of the, this changing worldview, this holistic worldview, which is gradually increasing in its influence. One aspect of it is Gaia, the idea of the Earth as a living organism, um, uh, rather than just a, a misty ball of rock hurtling around the sun in accordance with Luke Newton's laws of motion. So now, um, an, another way in which uh, nature is coming to life is through the rediscovery of purposes in nature. Um, 
within the branch of mathematics called dynamics, um, they found that the best way to model many different processes in nature is in terms of a pull from ahead rather than a push from the past. And this is called the concept of the attractor or dynamical attractor. The basic model in dynamics is of a basin. Think of a pudding basin uh, in which you, to which you throw little balls. The balls, the balls roll around the basin. Um, uh, it doesn't matter which angle you throw them in from or how big the ball is. They roll around and they all end up at the bottom of the basin. That's called the basin of attraction. And the bottom of the basin is where they'll end up. And you can make a mathematical model uh, in terms of how they'll end up by being attracted to that, rather than how they're pushed and pulled, each one different, with is much more complicated to do each individual push from the past and the angle and everything, easier to model them in terms of an attractor. In chaotic dynamics, there are chaotic attractors, and many branches of science are now modeled in terms of attractors, including the growth of animals and plants. Um, they're modeled in terms of morphogenetic fields, fields which shape the organism as a whole, being drawn towards attractors. Um, this kind of theory was worked out by a great French mathematician, René Tom, um, uh, and provides a way of thinking of the development of an oak tree as being pulled towards an attractor in a field which shapes the developing oak. This is very like Aristotle's idea of the soul of the oak tree. Instead of a soul, we've got a field. And in many ways in modern science, fields have replaced souls. Uh, in the ancient world, they thought magnets had souls. Um, and those were abolished with mechanistic science. But then in the 19th century, Michael Faraday introduced the idea of the magnetic field and the electric field, which are within and around the magnet, the thing they organize. Now we have the whole universe in the gravitational field. We have lots of fields in nature in quantum field theory. Uh, quantum particles each have their own kind of field. So um, what we've got now is, is fields with attractors, uh, which draw things towards ends or goals. And that again is a step back towards uh, a, a, a more animistic view of purposes within nature. Then uh, we have another huge step uh, in, in this reanimation of nature uh, was the uh, Big Bang Theory, which became scientifically orthodox around 1966. Before that, cosmologists thought that the universe was st static or eternal. Um, some of them thought it was running out of steam and heading towards a heat death. Uh, that the whole universe would eventually end up uh, sort of frozen uh, forever. Um, and uh, that was a still a machine view of an eternal machine running out of steam. But in 1966, everything was changed with the Big Bang Theory. The universe now began very s small and very hot, tiny, much less than the size of a head of a pin, very, very hot with almost no structure. And ever since then, it's been expanding and cooling down. And as it cools down and expands, more and more things come into existence within it, more and more patterns of activity. Um, at first atoms and molecules and then stars and, um, and galaxies. Um, and then on Earth, uh, rocks and crystals, and, and then animals, plants, microbes, the evolution of life, all of these things are happening within the developing, evolving cosmos. This is nothing like a machine. It's as if the whole universe has come to life. The Big Bang is like the hatching of the cosmic egg in ancient myths, uh, which saw the universe coming forth from a kind of biological origin and growing like a a growing plant or like an embryo with new forms and structures coming within it. So this is, um, a cosmology has given us a very different view of nature. There's nothing like a machine. It's much more like a developing organism. Cosmology has also given us another remarkable insight into the nature of nature. Um, in order to understand the way the universe is, physicists have postulated that 95% of reality uh, consists of dark matter and dark energy, uh, forms of matter and energy about which we know nothing. Um, basically what they're saying is 95% of reality is utterly unknown to us, is nature is totally obscure. Um, it's as if 
science has discovered the cosmic unconscious. Um, it's no longer the, like early 19th century science where they thought you have clear, distinct ideas in which everything is predictable and understandable. 95% of matter and energy is nothing like what we've studied in physics or know about through physics textbooks or biology textbooks. Or, um, it's utterly unknown to us, and yet it shapes the whole of reality that we live in. Um, that, again, is a very remarkable discovery. And I think the final change that's happening in our worldview, which is bringing us back into an animistic view of nature, is a discussion about the nature of the mind. The materialist theory uh, tells us that the mind is nothing but the activity of the brain. Minds are what brains do, is a materialist slogan. Um, that uh, your mind and my mind are nothing but the activity of our nervous system. Well, that view is, has been taken for granted in science for a long time. And in, in, in 20th century psychology, in the English-speaking world, it was the basis of psychology itself. The behaviorist school of psychology pretended that consciousness didn't exist, or that it at least didn't do anything, and that the business of scientific psychology should be to study muscular movements and behavior and glandular secretions, because these were scientifically and objectively measurable, and totally ignore consciousness. Incredible. A form of psychology that denies or ignores consciousness, and that was mainstream. Uh, you know, the most eminent professors in our greatest universities were teaching that for decades. However, that the, the, the reign of behaviorism began to wane in the late 20th century, firstly because of the rise of cognitive science that said, well, uh, we can get further by thinking the brain, of the brain as a computer and then making computer models of brains. Um, that was still very mechanistic, and the computers are unconscious. So um, that was, a, 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 in a sense, it made it more mechanistic in the sense that it gave a, a more persuasive machine model for the nature of minds. But that became, began to unravel for several reasons. First, in the late 20th century, there was the rise of consciousness studies. People started studying consciousness itself instead of ignoring it. For example, through the study of meditation and the effects of meditation, studies that began in the 1970s, they were pioneering studies uh, showing how people's consciousness changed through meditation. And this change in consciousness had effects on physiology and well-being. Uh, this was a spiritual practice that became scientifically measurable, showing there were distinct effects on consciousness. In the late 1960s, the rise of psychedelic research when psychedelics were still legal, um, led to an enormous expansion of people's views of and understanding of consciousness. And that phase is resuming now as psychedelic research is becoming legal again in various parts of the world. Um, then there were studies of near-death experiences and other altered states of consciousness, all of them revealing realms of consciousness that didn't fit very well into the mechanistic model that wouldn't have been predicted by the computer model of algorithms and data processing. And then in the 1990s, uh, a devastating shock to that view came with the uh, uh, revelation that was new to scientists, but not very new to most other people, that emotions played a part in thinking. Uh, the uh, Antonio de Marcia wrote a book called Descartes' Error in 1994, in which he argued that human thought and behavior is influenced by emotions, and that we have uh, emotions like fear and so on, which we share the physiology of with animals. Well, it's obviously true. We do share the physiology, adrenaline, fight or flight reactions. Uh, uh, but what Damasio pointed out was that emotions affect the way people think, the way, the way they evaluate options they, and that they make choices. Well, this was a terrible shock to scientists because computers don't have emotions. Um, and therefore, they all, our brains ought not to have emotions or be influenced by them. Uh, and so this, again, uh, opened up the debate uh, within uh, science. Now, for people who aren't within science, telling them that science has now revealed that emotions influence the way people make choices 
and, and, and the way they think is not a devastating novelty. It's not a brilliant new discovery. It's common sense. Um, but nevertheless, scientists have had to take it on board, and it's led to an enlarged view of minds. Now, the attempts to reduce all minds to nothing but the brain, the materialist attempt, has now become challenged uh, philosophically as well. Increasing numbers of philosophers are finding it difficult to persuade themselves and other people that consciousness does nothing, uh, that we have no free will, um, that it's just an illusion. Um, uh, some philosophers, uh, materialist philosophers, think consciousness does nothing. It's an epiphenomenon uh, uh, that uh, accompanies physical processes in the brain but doesn't affect them. Um, some think it's just another way of talking about physical processes, and again, it doesn't do anything. Some think it's an illusion, um, and they can think they can explain consciousness away by saying it's an illusion produced by brains. The trouble is, it doesn't really explain it away, uh, because um, illusion itself is a mode of consciousness. It presupposes consciousness. And materialist philosophers go round and round in, in circles trying to explain away consciousness or get rid of it. Um, uh, and that's why the very existence of human consciousness is called the hard problem for materialists. Um, materialism just can't deal with the hard problem. Um, uh, it remains the hard problem. And that's why some philosophers are now trying to find another way forward, which is called panpsychism. Pan means everywhere, and psyche means mind or soul. Um, the Greek word psyche, as in psychology, is, is soul. Uh, the Latin word is anima, um, the, in, leading to the idea of animism. Panpsychism and animism are very similar. Um, panpsychism uh, attempts to solve the hard problem by saying, well, instead of saying that consciousness is different in kind from everything else in the universe, so that the entire universe is unconscious until the light bulb of consciousness is switched on inside complex brains just on Earth. And basically, we've got more than anyone else. So uh, humans are the most conscious things in the universe because our bra brains are more complex than anything else. That's the standard view, um, uh, that it's different in kind um, from everything else. What they're saying is that it's different in degree that if you say there's a small amount of consciousness in an electron, an atom, mind, or experience, you can use different words, awareness, experience is perhaps the best word, um, then uh, a, a molecule might have more experience than uh, more complexities, more possibilities of experience than an atom. Uh, in a, a single living cell would have more than a non-living system, and a complex brain like ours has many more possibilities um, and uh, more experience and uh, more consciousness. It becomes a difference of degree. And many panpsychists uh, find this a much more attractive philosophy uh, than old-style mechanistic materialism. Uh, Galen Strawson was one of the first to open this debate in its modern form, a British uh, philosopher of mind. Thomas Nagel, the American philosopher of mind, uh, came out for panpsychism around 2012 in a book called Mind and Cosmos, why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false, arguing that there are purposes in nature and that there are many kinds of mind in nature. Um, recently, Philip Goff, another panpsychist philosopher, has put forward a particularly clear um, statement of this view in his book, Galileo's Error. Um, and so panpsychism is now very much part of academic debate. And essentially what it's doing is opening up a new uh, era of animism. Most contemporary panpsychists, though, um, are still quite close to materialism. They're saying that uh, materialism doesn't explain the inner nature of things. We'll just put psyche or experience there. Uh, but it doesn't really make much difference to the scientific worldview. It makes it a different way of thinking about it. But it doesn't lead to new experiments or new measurements or anything like that. Um, a much more radical form of panpsychism was put forward by Alfred North Whitehead, who I've already mentioned, in the 1920s. 
When Whitehead realized that quantum theory tells us that nature is made up of processes, not things, that an electron is a wave, a vibratory wave, a pattern of activity, um, what he realized is that this uh, wave uh, must take time. A wave can't be a wave at an instant. You can't have a wave at a particular at any point or in space or in time. Think of the waves on the sea. If you just look at a tiny sliver of a wave, at, 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 try to make it a point, it stops being a wave. And it takes time to wave. And the fact that it takes time is the ultimate reason uh, and space for a wave to exist is the ultimate reason for the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. You can't pin things down to a point or an instant. So um, Whitehead pointed out that even electrons are processes, atoms are processes, everything in nature is a process, not a thing. And if it's a process, it's a process in time. And if it's in time, it has time within it, uh, a polarity in time, a past and a future pole. And Whitehead then had the brilliant idea of thinking in terms of the relation between mind and body, in terms of time, not space. Usually when we hear discussions of the mind-body problem, um, they're couched in spatial metaphors, the inner life, the outer world. Uh, even mystics and people talk about the inner life or look within. I mean, these are all spatial metaphors um, about uh, the nature of the mind the inside of things, as opposed to the outside of things, which is the physical world. What Whitehead argued was that actually this polarity in time gives us a completely different view, and, and one that I, personally I find much more meaningful and helpful. Um, the future pole is the mental pole. The mental pole of things um, is about possibilities. Um, Minds are about possibilities and about choosing among them. I'm now talking about conscious minds as opposed to unconscious habits. Uh, so consciousness is about possibility. And uh, possibilities are, are what the future contains. The future is full of possibilities. They're not yet physical facts. When they become physical facts, uh, then they're, they're measurable and science can deal with them in the new normal way. Uh, and what Whitehead suggested is that the mind is the future pole and the body uh, is the past pole. As soon as it becomes a bodily fact, it's scientifically measurable. Um, and even in the case of electrons, this is so. The electron is described in quantum physics by the Schrodinger wave equation. And the wave equation tells you all the possible things the electron could do. An electron, starting out from a cathode ray tube right now, for example, has a whole range of possible things it could do described by this equation. They're all possibilities. They're not physical facts. When the electron interacts with something, a measuring apparatus or another atom or, or, or whatever, um, it when it interacts, uh, all these different possibilities collapse down to one actual uh, measurable fact, uh, which is now measurable, uh, and it's sometimes called the collapse of the wave function. Uh, out of these possibilities, a, a kind of decision is made and something happens. It's now physically a fact. Now, what Whitehead is suggesting is that's what's going on in our own minds too. Our conscious minds choose among possibilities, then we make decisions and those become measurable facts. And the whole of nature is working that way. Everything that's self-organizing has a kind of mind um, which is open to different possible futures. Um, and when it chooses among them, often on the basis of habit, so it doesn't require much consciousness, uh, most of our own choices are habitual, um, but they, it then becomes a measurable fact. So what Whitehead's suggesting is there are two strains, or two kinds of causality. There's one kind of causality coming from the past, the ordinary kind physics is familiar with, the energy, the flow, the ball rolling down a hill, an electric current, uh, the light that left the sun eight minutes ago that's falling on us now. The causality is a flow of, through energy from the past. That's regular physical causality. It's what Aristotle called the moving cause. It's that aspect of Aristotle's thought and, and matter, which physics deals with very well, is what material, Aristotle called the material cause. But what this idea of Whitehead shows is that the final cause, the purpose of things in the future, which and the formal causes, uh, are coming uh, from this future realm of 
this realm of possibility, uh, which is working uh, as a directional causation that works from the future towards the past. And in the present, these realms of causation, these kinds of causation overlap. So you have mental causation interacting with physical causation in the present. That's why we can make decisions, why our minds can influence our brains, why our brains are influenced by material causes and also energetic causes that depend on energy and food and all the kinds of things physiology tells us about. So anyway, Whitehead um, opens up a way of thinking about the mind-body relationship, not just in us, but in all nature. Uh, which I think is very liberating and, and very stimulating. One footnote, or perhaps clarification, I should add to the panpsychist view. The panpsychist view says that self-organizing systems have some kind of mind or experience. Organisms that are whole, are things that are holons, that are self-organizing, plants, animals, molecules, crystals, galaxies, stars, uh, planetary systems, solar systems, uh, flocks of birds. It doesn't apply to aggregates of matter, mere aggregates like a heap of stones or a chair or a table, things that are put together um, that don't organize themselves, or a machine, a computer, or a car, or a sock, or a stone, or a chair. Sometimes people make fun of panpsychism by saying, oh, are you saying this chair's conscious then? Or do you mean this sock? Do you mean your socks are conscious? Um, well, that's a, a common kind of objection, but that's not what panpsychists are saying. They're saying the socks may contain crystals and molecules, which may have some degree of psychic awareness, uh, but the aggregate of these things is not in itself conscious. That means that the mechanistic theory, which takes the machine as the central metaphor for the whole of nature, couldn't be a worse model, because machines are some of the very few things in nature which are not self-organizing, um, which don't have uh, organizing psyche or holistic organizing principles. Um, whereas animals and plants and planets and, say, and our own bodies and minds and our, everything else does, it's much better to think in terms of organisms as Whitehead suggested. So all these changes mean that what effectively is happening now is we're returning to a sense of living nature. The earth is alive, Gaia. The um, Animals and plants are truly organisms with fields that organize them, holistic organizing fields with attractors that help motivate them, with minds and awareness and experience. Our experience is different from other organisms' experience, but they have experience too of their own kind. You know, a butterfly has butterfly experiences, a hummingbird has hummingbird experiences, we have human experiences. Um, um, but then it also opens us up to realms of thinking that most of us are very unfamiliar with. We've got used to thinking of the sun, for example, as an inanimate hydrogen bomb-like object in the sky governed by laws of physics and studied by astronomers uh, and uh, dealt with in physics textbooks. But in a holistic living world, then the sun could become a living organism. The galaxy is a living organism. The entire solar system is a living organism, not just Gaia, the Earth. Um, and if the sun's a living organism, it might have a mind. Is the sun conscious? Well, this is a topic I've been exploring recently um, with a group of um, uh, colleagues in physics and in other branches of, and in philosophy. Um, and I think one can make a very strong case for the sun being conscious. First of all, it's a self-organizing system. Clearly, it organizes itself. It's not being put together in a factory or it's not a random assembly of things. It's, it's got a, a boundary, the photosphere that we see. It's got beyond that the corona. It, the whole solar system has a membrane around it called the heliopause. Uh, and uh, the whole solar, the heliosphere is, is the larger organism within which the Earth is. Um, the, the sun also has complex, very complex electromagnetic patterns of activity going on within it, which our brains do too. And many people, even materialists, uh, think that the interface between the mind and the brain is somehow the electromagnetic activity of the brain. Uh, some would say that is the mind. Um, 
Well, uh, the sun has much more complex electromagnetic patterns going on within it, within the granules on its surface, within the supergranules, within the solar flares, within the magnetic fields between the sunspots, uh, in coronal mass ejections, in the solar wind that pours out from the sun all the time. It's vastly electromagnetic. In fact, it's made of electromagnetic plasma. That's what the sun's body consists of. And uh, it has waves and ripples and all sorts of fractal versions of electromagnetic patterns going on within it all the time. That could easily be the interface of the sun's mind with the sun's body. And we are within the sun's mind, within its extended body, the heliosphere. Um, and if the sun has a mind, other stars would have minds too. And if they have minds, then the whole galaxy can have a mind. The stars are like cells within the body of the galaxy. There could be a galactic mind. And if there's a galactic mind, a cosmic mind, ultimately. Uh, the entire cosmos uh, was, is not just an inanimate machine, um, but it may have a, a cosmic mind that um, works in and through the universal gravitational field and the universal electromagnetic field that permeates the entire universe. Well, this is a very different way of thinking about nature from the one we're used to. And um, it's unfamiliar. It's certainly scientifically unfamiliar, but it's certainly not irrational to think like that. Um, we can, if the sun uh, has a mind, and if the electromagnetic fields are an interface between the mind of the sun and the sun, we can study something about it by, as we already are doing, looking at those electromagnetic patterns of activity. After all, with animal minds, I mean, even the most hardcore materialists are usually prepared to admit that dogs have some kind of mind, or cats. I mean, older type materialists didn't, they denied that. Uh, but. Uh, there's been a change in animal behavior studies. Uh, about 10 years ago, there was a, a conference in Cambridge that issued the so-called Cambridge Declaration on Animal Consciousness that said that after studying lots and lots of facts and animal behavior and reviewing the scientific literature, uh, researchers on animal behavior had come to the conclusion that animals might have some kind of consciousness. Well, Anyone who's kept a dog or cat reached that conclusion a very long time ago. Um, um, but this is now official. Uh, and uh, if, uh, But of course, we can't know what it's like to be in the mind of a dog. We can imagine to some extent. We can empathize to some extent. We can measure electrical changes in dogs' brains. Um, um, and we're in a similar position about consciousness of anything in nature. We can't... I can't prove you're conscious. Um, uh, we have to assume other people are conscious. Uh, we can't prove it. And when we're coming to the inner life of other creatures, animals are the easiest to empathize with because they're most like us, mammals, especially mammals like dogs and cats. Um, and indeed, many people do this every day with the animals they live with. Um, when it comes to something like the sun, uh, it's much harder because its mind may be vastly beyond ours in its scope, or it may be concerned with much more mundane matters, just keeping its own body and the solar system functioning in terms of electromagnetism and gravity. But it may have a mind that includes and understands what's going on here on Earth. And in fact, in traditional animistic societies, people have tried relating to the sun, uh, treating it as if they can have a conscious relationship with it. In shamanic cultures, uh, shamans sometimes journey to or make relay or, or connect with the sun. In India, um, practitioners of yoga often do um, a, a salutation to the sun every morning. The, it's called the... Uh, Surya Namaskar, the sun salutation. I do it myself, actually. Um, it's a yoga practice, which is a salutation to the morning sun, prostrating to the sun. The Gayatri Mantra, one of the key uh, mantras in Hinduism, is a prayer to the sun, asking the sun to illuminate our meditation, the glorious divine splendor of the sun. It's not saying the sun is God. It's saying the sun is a portal through which 
divine light can shine, that the light in nature is not totally separate from the ultimate conscious source of nature, um, that there's a kind of consciousness uh, working through all nature. So our ancestors in the Middle Ages and in almost all other cultures took the view that nature is alive, that our life in nature is related to the natural world, is deeply connected with it. Um, and uh, that in, in religious cultures where there was a, a God over and beyond nature, um, God was in nature and beyond nature, a view called panentheism, God in nature and nature in God. It's what most medieval theology, Christian theologians thought. Um, God was not separate from nature. Nature was not outside God, with God in a separate compartment, supernatural. Uh, all of nature reflected God's being. The great Franciscan medieval philosopher, St. Bonaventure, uh, said that every being in nature reflected the Holy Trinity, the ultimate inner conscious nature of God was actually reflected in all beings in nature, every plant, every animal. And as he'd now say, every molecule, every atom reflects this nature. Now, you may not want to go as far as God, um, and many people don't, uh, but the idea of a nature, a living nature, is something that... Um, more and more people are coming to recognize as making sense. It makes sense of our own experience. Of course, other living organisms are alive, and of course, um, animal dogs and cats uh, have a kind of consciousness. Of course, a butterfly flying uh, and looking at flowers and uh, is aware of what it's seeing and choosing which flower to land on. Um, of course, the uh, whole universe seems more like a living organism uh, than like a machine. Um, and of course, it creates hard problems if you try to pretend that we're nothing but a machine and our minds are nothing but uh, computer algorithms. It causes intolerable problems because it's so obviously false uh, and so obviously a limited view. And by growing up, by going beyond this mechanistic worldview, by recovering a sense of the life of nature, I think we can also come to recognize that we totally depend on the living nature of which we are part. The mechanistic view gave us the sense we're separate from nature. Our minds are superior to everything else in, on earth, if not the entire universe. And we can do with it what we like. We're the lords and masters of the cosmos, of nature. When we see we're part of a living world and that the living world uh, interacts with us as it is doing through the uh, viral epidemic, the COVID virus, it's remarkable that the smallest thing in, in the biological realm, viruses, but the smallest and least significant things that just get you know a little mention in biology textbooks on the very borderline of life um, have come to change our, all our lives and not only our lives, but our economy and the way we live on the earth. And we have to find new ways of living on the earth and living with the earth and living in the earth. And I think that having a science that tells us nature is alive and that we're part of the living world is a major step in that direction. It can't possibly harm us to recognize this. And I think it can help us a great deal. What's more, I think it can lead to science being better, more exciting, more true um, and uh, something that's actually more inspiring uh, and less life denying than it can often be at present. I think it will lead to a better kind of science and uh, a kind of science that can undergo a kind of renaissance of new discovery.